Alessandro did a wonderful job being provocative, and I'm sure there are a thousand questions, but given the content and direction of the next panel in which Alessandro will participate, I think I want to just move to that, and so I'd invite my panelists to come quietly to the front because I want to talk about a few ground rules before we get into the discussing part of the day. A um, couple of things. One, uh, we had a fellow here a few years ago named Wendy Seltzer, and Wendy Seltzer said, why are there never breaks during Silicon Flatirons events, right? There's this, like, biological needs that we don't serve. Um, so during Wendy's presence here, we would add these 10-minute bathroom breaks, but she's gone, so we no longer do that. Um, so, so bear with us as we, we work our way through lunch. A um, couple of other things, and this is in part uh, a private conversation between me and my co-moderators, Ryan Kahlo and Harry Surden, so the rest of you should not invade the privacy here. Um, number one, uh, because today is so packed, I would advise the moderators to not read the biographies um, of all the people we're having uh, today. I will do that for the keynotes, and I, I commend to you uh, the extensive biographies we put in the program. These are very, very impressive and qualified people. Secondly, given that we've asked people to publish with us, we think it only necessary and polite to allow them to come to the podium and present their findings. But that's not the way we do things here at Silicon Flatirons. I mean, we, we think most of the fun and interesting discussion uh, can't begin in earnest until we start talking with one another. What does this mean? This means I've given my uh, uh, paper panelists on the first panel 12 minutes. I've printed up little warning things I will flash before their eyes, and I will be really ruthless. And so uh, I'm encouraging 12 minutes, and uh, I will be ecstatic if anyone comes in under 12 minutes. Um, and then lastly, and this is perhaps uh, most important, for those of you who haven't been to Silicon Flatirons event before, we do something here that I affectionately coined a few years ago, the Wiser Rule. What the Wiser Rule says is during Q&A, the very first question must always be asked by a student. And because this is a law school, we are not afraid to call on students we recognize in the audience, even if they don't volunteer. Um, and so the pressure is on you students to begin thinking about what you want to ask these people. Okay, so from Alessandro's talk as our jumping off point, we are now going to add, try and answer uh, the first question that Alessandro, I think, has rightly demonstrated is actually many, many, many questions. Is there a market failure for information privacy? Um, and what I want to do is have the speakers come up in this order, Lior, then Lori, then Julie, then Scott. And so without further ado, Lior Strahilovitz. And you're on the clock, sir? Okay, so maybe we'll figure out where it is. Good. Perfect. Thanks so much. Well, thanks, Paul, and thanks uh, to all of you for coming. Um, I actually want to begin with some economic history and uh, um, spend the first half of my talk uh, with that economic history uh, in, in an effort to try and convince you that looking back can actually help us see a lot uh, uh, through the fog forward. So um, uh, let's start with 19th century England. You probably think about 19th century Europe as a place that had no social safety net, aside from the church anyway. Uh, in fact, England at least had a reasonably well-developed system for dispensing welfare to the impoverished. Uh, early in the 19th century, a British bureaucrat was stationed in every village, and that person would have been responsible for dispensing uh, cash to people who, was, who appealed for financial assistance. Uh, the local bureaucrat knew that Mrs. Butler was uh, destitute because she had lost her husband in the fire and that without welfare her children would not eat. Um, and uh, by the same token, the same bureaucrat knew that Mr. Johnson was a drunk and would take whatever welfare payment he received to the local pub and immediately waste the money. Uh, he could then in turn be generous to Mrs. Uh, Butler and uh, less generous to uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, by the 1830s, English urbanization was transforming fundamentally that society and posing new challenges to the system of dispensing welfare payments. In 1801, England had precisely one city with a population exceeding 100,000, but by the 1861 census, there were 11 such cities, uh, and London's population had grown to nearly 3 million. 
Now imagine the effects that this sort of urbanization would have on the welfare system that I described. Uh, workers from the countryside were flooding into towns. These British bureaucrats were being overwhelmed with credible claims of poverty and woe and far too many people seeking welfare payments uh, and, and the bureaucrats would have had a really difficult time figuring out who was more deserving and who was less deserving. So how was our bureaucrat to decide how to dispense the Crown's scarce welfare dollars? Uh, in 1834, the British government issued a new directive in an effort to help out these local bureaucrats. Uh, and going forward, the new rule under the statute was that if you wanted to receive any welfare from Great Britain, you had to live in a government-run workhouse. Uh, so what was, a work at, what was a workhouse? It was basically a state-run homeless shelter. Uh, one is pictured to my left. Um, at first blush, this seems like a crazy strategy for trying to dispense welfare in 19th century England. Uh, hiring a bureaucrat in every village is one thing, but running a workhouse is an extremely un extensive undertaking that required England to, bu to bloat its uh, governmental bureaucracy. Um, so the question is, what was England up to? And in order to figure out what England was up to, we need to know a little bit more about what life was like inside these workhouses. In a word, it was crummy. The workhouses were bleak, they were crowded, there was no booze allowed, and if you were able-bodied, you were required to work for whatever assistance you would receive. The only sort of people who would voluntarily agree to live in these sorts of conditions and under the state's thumb were people who had no other options. And for the truly destitute, such conditions were better than the alternative. But for um, uh, scam artists or for alcoholics, uh, this was not an appealing way to live. And so they decided to try and scrape out a living some other way. Uh, OK, so turning this into economic language, uh, we can identify the information asymmetry. When government officials had the same information that welfare applicants had about themselves, when a local village official knew the life history of everyone, then they could effectively sort the deserving and the undeserving into two different piles. But now, all of a sudden, because of urbanization, welfare uh, applicants had information about themselves that it would be costly for the government uh, to obtain. The, go the government can no longer accurately distinguish between the deserving and the less deserving. So it created these institutions, the workhouses, that would force the less deserving to sort themselves out. Uh, the British government had to grow its bureaucracy in order to achieve this strategy, but it may well have saved more by um, avoiding waste than it lost by uh, paying all these additional bureaucrats. Okay, so now uh, let us consider the modern era. The pendulum that swung rapidly to the left in the 19th century as a result of urbanization is now swinging just as rapidly back uh, to the right. Because of the rise of information processing technologies and the decline in privacy, we're experiencing a phenomenon that's the functional equivalent of de-urbanization. So one of my claims is that our society is beginning to resemble England in 1801 rather than England in 1861. And I think to illustrate this trend most starkly, I actually want to go uh, to another former English colony first, uh, contemporary India. Although India's cities are rapidly modernizing and its technological capacities are developing, India is still plagued by widespread poverty. India, Indian welfare is still, this will sound familiar, dispensed by local government bureaucrats in small villages. Uh, Indian bureaucrats will essentially refuse to give any welfare payments to someone who the bureaucrat does not personally know. Uh, and the Indian villager's relationship with his local government official is therefore the equivalent of his or her social security number. An Indian who's interested in upward mobility might try and migrate to the next village or town over, but in so doing, he's basically flushed his or her identity down the drain and will encounter a local government official who says, I don't know you, why should I give you any welfare rather than giving it to the people who I've known for a long time. India has 600,000 villages, but because of these problems, most of its poor people are essentially trapped in one of them. The opportunities for the state to ameliorate a problem of this nature are limited. India can't build workhouses, after all, for a third of its population. And while private sector growth in India has been robust, there's little demand for a largely unskilled workforce in far-flung areas poorly served by infrastructure. 
uh, India's poor need to make it to cities if they want to experience upward mobility. But uh, precisely because their social safety net is so dependent on their relationships with local government officials, India experiences substantial labor market dislocation. So what is India to do? Uh, its innovation is to create the world's largest biometric database, something called Adhar. Uh, within the next several years, Indian government officials hope to collect iris scans, fingerprints, photographs, etc., for all of uh, India's 1.2 billion citizens. And each piece of bio biometric data is going to be linked to a name, an address, a gender, an age, and a 12-digit unique identifier. This is a very big deal in a society where the rural poor basically have no identities outside of their villages. In the apt words of uh, Nandan Nilakani, uh, the software mogul who founded Infosys and who's now building the database for the government, quote, what we are creating is as important as a road. A recent New York, New York Times article on Adhar told the story of Muhammad Jalil, uh, who after having his iris and his fingerprint scanned, pointed at the Adhar computer station and told a reporter, quote, that will give me an identity. It will show that I am a human being, that I am alive, that I live on this planet. It will prove that I am an Indian. The ability of government and corporate offices to authenticate Jalil's identity, no matter where in the country he goes, uh, is going to finally enable him to become, he thinks, a full citizen in the economic life of the nation. And banks, telecom companies, healthcare providers are going to be able to tap into this database as well. I think this quote, uh, to the extent we give it credit, suggests that it's not as though privacy advocates have a monopoly on all the fundamental metrics of human flourishing. So what, Indi what these technologies are attempting to do in India is combine the benefits of modernity, right, uh, free exit, uh, free mobility of labor and capital, with the benefits of a rural society where everybody knows everyone else and everyone knows everyone's business. So now, let's see if this says anything about contemporary America. We've, of course, already lived through many of the changes that Adhar hopes to bring to India. Uh, credit card companies uh, have long been tracking things like what kinds of balances we carry and how quickly we pay off our bills. But firms are now, of course, branching into much more powerful analytics. Uh, firms are drilling down to see what sorts of items we purchase and how that affects our propensity to repay uh, our, our lines of credit quickly. The early leader in this sort of analytics was a Canadian credit card issuer, which discovered, fascinatingly, uh, that people who buy felt pads to be placed under uh, the legs of chairs and tables are extraordinarily good credit risks. Uh, it turns out that the same sort of person who's compulsive about not scratching the hardwood floors is compulsive about paying their bills on time. Um, by aggregating data for multiple databases and geolocation services and using data mining techniques to find whatever patterns exist, companies like Apple, Verizon, and Square can piece together consumer profiles that make FICO scores look exceptionally crude. At the same time, rapid advances in facial recognition technologies and other biometrics enable firms and governments to link up these online identities and databases with people's bodies as they move through space. The combination of biometric detection with existing databases is a potent one. For example, thanks to Megan's Law, facial photographs of most convicted sex offenders are basically in the public domain. It's pretty straightforward to grab all of these photographs and then link the database to video cameras, which are running in real-time facial recognition software protocols, and then allow for an immediate alert to be issued whenever a sex offender steps near a daycare or a school or a private residence. Such technologies facilitate a precise form of exclusion that would have never been po possible previously. And in the consumer product spaces, especially for luxury products, we'll see more firms maximizing revenues by being picky about which consumers can associate themselves with a commodity or an experience. Exclusivity sells. We may, in short, enter an era in which something like perfect exclusion is possible. The result is going to be far more precise sorting than anything we've experienced so far. To be sure, information asymmetries won't disappear entirely. There'll be some spurious correlations that cause producers to miscategorize some consumers. And consumers may try to opt out of sharing information that they know is going to disadvantage them financially. Some consumers may engage in smokescreen behavior designed to throw off the entities that are monitoring behavior. Consumers might buy up felt pads and then throw them away, reasoning that felt pads are cheap, but a mortgage payment uh, is expensive. Uh, of course, smart algorithms might detect this subterfuge, too. Uh, if you buy up felt pads regularly and then pay a contractor to resurface your floors, 
uh, well, may God have mercy on your credit score. <laughs> Uh, given the rise of these linked databases and the increased precision of biometrics, these are interesting times ahead. If the social science evidence is to be believed, then the increased clustering of like-minded individuals into neighborhoods, workplaces, and schools is likely to reduce conflict and enhance the propensity of people to participate in politics and local governance. Homogeneity, we know, streamlines decision-making and makes it easier to satisfy most people's preferences. Businesses with better algorithms for predicting how customers are going to behave, we'll have, higher, we'll have higher profits and happier customers. But there are, of course, downsides to all of this homogeneity. Perfect exclusion shifts the power of choosing who is included and who's excluded from consumers back to producers, and the result is that people have less opportunity to try fitting in with a different crowd or infiltrating a club that may not want them. And because the realm of pri private consumption is shrinking and public consumption is growing, we may see the onset of what I'll call signaling exhaustion. People no longer buying the products they want, but people buying the products that, they, that send the right signals to third parties. Politicians, political parties are using data mining with increased sophistication as well, and this goes largely unregulated, but the practice shouldn't be uncontroversial. When incumbents can know with massive granularity uh, which voters are likely to support them and which are not, it may skew their incentives to perform constituent services or take into account voter preferences. Moreover, segregating people cements inexisting uh, inequality by homogenizing uh, social networks, which in turn results in unequal access to information about life and job opportunities. It may also inhibit self-discovery, as Julie Cohen has eloquently argued, or distort people's political views, as Cass Sunstein has posited. One of the invigorating things about li lingering in public spaces in urban areas or being called for jury duty is the opportunity it gives you to interact with a representative cross-section of the people in your community. It's that, serendipity of, it's that serendipity of essential, random connections with other human beings that makes urban life interesting but also potentially threatening. Uh, to conclude, uh, a world in which uh, uh, the cost of sorting people approaches zero isn't a world without serendipitous interactions. Chat roulette, after all, was a fad, at least for a little while. Uh, but given existing preferences, such a world is likely one in which the haves spend more time in the luxury boxes and the have not spend more time in the cheap seats or perhaps outside of the stadium altogether. Uh, and the less time is devoted to these serendipitous meetings, the harder it becomes for everyone to understand their fellow citizens' motivations, empathize with their problems, and celebrate their achievements. Thank you very much. I'm glad that Lior gave me the opportunity to, to explain that two of our panelists have new books coming out on this, or recently out, so that you should buy them, every one of you should buy them. Do you have a slide? No, I'm just using it for notes. Okay. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, and uh, I wrote a, a paper um, on uh, standardized mechanisms for privacy notice and choice. And I thought this would be a short paper, but it turns out I actually had a lot to say. Uh, so I'll try to give you um, the 12-minute version. Um, so I, I begin um, by thinking back to 1996 when the FTC started holding privacy workshops. And I'm feeling a lot of deja vu here. Um, Back then in 1996, there was a lot of talk about a market-based notice and choice approach for privacy. Um, there was a lot of talk about how uh, privacy notices were unreadable, unusable, all the things we keep hearing over and over again today, but that they could be saved through the use of user empowerment tools. Um, and the, the user empowerment tools that were talked about um, included some of the things that the privacy seal programs would provide, um, as well as a notion of a computer-readable privacy policy called P3, which later became P3P. Um, today, uh, we still have some of these privacy seal programs. We now have um, a new computer-readable uh, mechanism called Do Not Track. And we have um, the ad choices icon, which is this privacy icon that the ad industry is putting on all their behavioral ads. Um, so I want to look back at what happened with P3P to look at some lessons learned and, um, and to look at what's going on so far with ad choices and the idea of opting out of behavioral advertising. 
So the idea behind P3P was that nobody wants to read privacy policies um, and that if your web browser could read them for you, then this would be a good thing. Uh, because your web browser could read them, it could know what you like, what you don't like, uh, it might even be able to actually negotiate with websites, uh, but at the very least it could raise a red flag if you were about to provide your information to a website that had a bad privacy policy. Um, and uh, so this seemed like a, a pretty nice idea and the World Wide Web Consortium agreed to try to build it. Uh, I was um, involved in that from the beginning and actually chaired that working group through um, much of the very long multi-year uh, process that it took to produce P3P. Um, it took about five years to agree on the vocabulary for P3P. Um, it wasn't that we had difficult technical problems to build this system. It was that we couldn't agree on what were the fundamental elements in a privacy disclosure that we needed to standardize in computer readable language. And we had um, participants from consumer groups, from regulators, from industry groups, and it was international. Um, so I, mean, I remember some, some very tense conversations involving representatives from the French CNIL who were disagreeing with um, representatives from the American Direct Marketing Association over what belongs in a privacy policy. Um, but after uh, five years of um, haggling over it, uh, eventually uh, out, out at the end came this um, computer readable language for privacy policies. Um, and uh, a system where, where, in fact, your web browser could automatically go read privacy policies. Um, Microsoft um, obliged by actually building this into Internet Explorer 6, um, and uh, it later was built into IE7, IE8, IE9, so it still exists in the Microsoft web browser. Um, Netscape built it into Netscape 7, but Netscape is no longer, um, and there are no other major web browsers that actually built it. Um, there was talk of P3P 1.0 was nice, but it had a lot of problems. Let's make P3P 1.1. Um, we tried that, uh, but uh, by that point, um, the FTC was no longer holding regular workshops on privacy, and interest in P3P was kind of diminishing, and the companies basically stopped participating in the process, and W3C said, well, in that case, we're just going to close the working group and move on to other things. Um, so not very much active work then continued on on P3P after that, um, but there are a number of uh, academics who continued looking at it, and including myself. Um, and my students have actually done quite a few projects using P3P. It's, it's if nothing else, has been a great um, uh, academic and, and learning tool. Um, one of the things we did is we built a search engine called Privacy Finder that um, you do your search and you get the, say, top 10 results back. Each one you go and check the P3P policy and you actually put a privacy meter in your search results. So you annotate like your Google search results with a privacy meter. Um, and so you can see at a glance which websites have better privacy policies. Um, and this uh, turns out is actually pretty useful for people and we conducted some studies um, in our lab uh, where we actually had people go shopping online using this tool and we were able to show that people would actually change their purchasing decisions on the basis of having this privacy information and they would actually pay for privacy. Um, when this information was in their face, they didn't have to go find a privacy policy, read through 10 pages of it um, and, and try to compare it. Um, so, uh, so P3P has some use. Um, unfortunately, none of the search engines, you know, commercial available search engines actually built anything like that. Um, and the Microsoft implementation of P3P in their web browser um, is not anything like that either. Um, the, the Microsoft implementation basically just looks at a part of the P3P policy called a compact policy um, that relates to the privacy practices with respect to cookies. Um, and it uses it to make cookie blocking decisions. Um, and the default setting, which 99.99% of um, internet users have, um, this is on by default, and um, your, your cookies will get blocked if they're third-party cookies that don't have this compact policy. Um, so that was a good incentive for companies that rely on, compact, uh, on, on third-party cookies to actually adopt P3P compact policies. 
Um, so that seemed pretty nice. Um, but uh, my students started noticing something fishy going on there with these compact policies. Um, and so we did a research project um, a couple of years ago where we actually collected compact policies from 33,000 websites and started looking at them for errors. Um, and we came up with some automated tools so we didn't have to read 33,000 policies. And through our automatic tools, we were able to find errors in over 11,000 of them. Um, so that's at least a third of them have errors, and it's probably much higher. This is just what we could easily automatically detect. Um, and this wasn't just, you know, those kind of, you know, iffy websites. These were, these included trustee certified websites. These included websites in the top 100 most visited websites. Um, we found that part of the reason for this is that word was getting out that if you didn't want your cookies blocked, you should put in a bogus P3P policy. Um, big companies were doing it too. Amazon had one, Facebook had one. Facebook's was kind of interesting. It was just the word honk. We don't know why. Um, <laughs> but it kept their cookie from getting blocked. Um, there was a lawsuit about the Amazon one that was just um, dismissed yesterday. Um, uh, so uh, it, it's, it was interesting to see that um, what seemed like a good idea with P3P kind of um, devolved into something um, really not very useful um, and perhaps even counterproductive. Um, it, it's arguable that perhaps P3P may now be doing more harm than good. Um, and um, it seems like the sort of thing that you would expect maybe some regulators might jump in on and, and, and take a look at. Um, but as far as I know, no regulators in the US or elsewhere um, have done anything about this, or at least none of them have made anything public uh, if they are uh, doing something about that. Okay, so that's P3P. Let me quickly talk a little bit about um, online behavioral advertising. Um, so there's uh, these industry groups, the NAI, the DAA, that have um, developed guidelines for the industry to follow um, to self-regulate on online behavioral advertising. And basically they say that companies have to provide some clear, meaningful notice, and they have to provide consumers ways to opt out. So um, my students um, have done some studies where they've basically done a census of uh, these advertising companies and top websites to see whether they have clear, meaningful notices and whether they have working opt-out mechanisms. Um, and we've seen there's been a flurry of activity um, over the past few months because um, the industry has uh, had some kind of self-imposed deadlines. But even after all of their deadlines, there's still a big compliance gap that, that uh, companies are just not complying with their own guidelines. Um, then we did another study where we said, well, do consumers actually understand what any of this is? Um, and we asked consumers, you know, what is this icon? What do you think would happen if you clicked on it? Um, we found that pretty much nobody recognizes the icon. They have no idea what it is. And um, most of them, the last thing they would ever do is click on it because they assume that it means that they're going to be like getting more ads. Um, that not that they're going to be opting out of ads. Um, so that seems to be failing consumers. Um, then we did a, a, a test of some uh, opt-out tools. So there are a number of uh, tools that consumers can use. Some are developed by the industry, some are developed by privacy advocates, some are built into your web browsers. Um, and we had uh, users uh, install them and try to use them to set up their privacy settings the way they wanted to, to have the privacy settings set. Um, and we found that people had an awful time making them actually work for themselves. Um, there's a lot of jargon in these tools. There's a lot of information about privacy that you have to understand in order to use the tools. And we found that people would assume that if you turn the tool on, that it's going to block everything. And we had people that said, well, this, this tool is great. I'd like to block all of this uh, tracking. I've turned on the tool. I'm safe now. When in fact, yes, they turned on the tool, um, and it was giving them notifications about tracking, but it wasn't actually blocking anything. Um, and so people were, were extremely confused by that. Um, so it seems that um, you know, the experience that we've had with P3P as well as the more recent experience with, um, with the OBA tools um, 
is really not all that promising. Um, and um, as I said, it seems like deja vu. We, we seem to kind of going, be going through um, this pattern where we have a lot of interest in privacy, a lot of people saying, yes, we're going to build tools, we're going to do this user empowerment. Um, and I think right now we're kind of perhaps near the crest of that wave again. Um, and then I fear that um, it will be you know, only a matter of a year or two when we lose interest, the tools don't work, and it all comes crashing back down. Um, so I'm, at this point, not all that optimistic. <laughs> So on that skeptical note, yeah. Julie, go on. <laughs> okay. Thank you for having me. It's always fun to come here. It's always fun to come here in the winter. This is the second snowiest it's ever been. Um, the, the, the most snowy time I couldn't see the street signs, so this was good. Uh, so, um, so when I got the, um, one of the initial descriptions of the conference and the panel from Paul, um, at some point he used the term information privacy markets. Um, and and um, I want to start by um, riffing on that term a little bit. Uh, uh, the, um, it struck me as I was thinking about what I would say here um, is, is that the term information privacy markets is weird, right? Um, a market for widgets produces widgets, right? Um, a market for automobiles produces automobiles. The term information privacy markets tends to suggest that markets in personal information exist to produce information privacy, and it struck me that this is just not true. Um, information privacy markets exist to produce information for purposes of market segmentation and risk management by a variety of commercial and, and sometimes public actors. The customers in these markets are not principally individuals who might value a state of information privacy. They're businesses that purchase B2B services relating to market segmentation and risk management from other businesses. Um, we could say a lot about these activities, and, and I'll say some things, but, but it strikes me that it's very odd to say that the sum total of all this is, is an information privacy market. We, we could say, if the theme of our inquiry today is, is why aren't we talking more about economics, we could certainly say that this activity generates a mix of private and social wealth and a mix of private and social costs. Um, and a question, of course, is how we ought to proceed to evaluate the balance of costs and benefits. Um, behavioral economic analysis of so-called information privacy markets, which is another thing we're here today to celebrate, tends to focus on the private costs. Um, and, and that's a, the, a consequence of the method, I think, and it leads to great interest in the question whether privacy markets could, in fact, be made to produce more privacy or any privacy at all, a question about which Lori is pessimistic, um, and Alessandro to some extent, um, if the markets were better calibrated according to the things that we're learning from behavioral economics about human behavior. <laughs> Those are interesting questions. I think they're important, but they're also a way of avoiding other interesting and important questions about the social costs of so-called information privacy markets. Um, what information privacy markets produce other than information privacy? Whether we might need less of the particular commodity that they produce, and if so, why we have such a difficult time arguing or even considering that we might need less of that commodity. Um, what I want to argue to you today, um, and this is kind of a potted version of, a, of like two chapters of a book, so um, I'll do my best, um, is that all of us, um, whether we're uh, you know eggheads, whether we're legal scholars or lawyers or policymakers, people who actually do real stuff, we all have an extraordinarily hard time talking about this because of the particular ideological commitments um, with which we tend to come to privacy at the deepest level. So privacy people, scholars and lawyers and policymakers in the US at least are all good liberals. And by this, I don't mean that we're all a bunch of left wingers, although some of us are. Um, what I mean instead is that our training is informed at a deep, uh, nearly instinctual level by the core commitments of liberal political theory, and in particular, the propositions that individuals are autonomous choosers and that free flows of information lead inevitably to the discovery of truth. And again, this is so whether or not we're academics and whether or not we enjoy armchair philosophizing, they're in our, these commitments are in our cultural DNA and they affect everything that we do and think. These commitments make us reluctant to engage directly with the asserted justifications for seeking more information. 
Um, and so we avoid the problem. Uh, if we're privacy advocates, we prefer to advocate privacy by describing some other incommensurable good that privacy would promote. Doing that, though, passes over a critical moment in which we effectively concede the need to get more and more information um, uh, and, and concede the, 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 uh, the enormity of that need and link it to a powerful imperative that relates to the value of information and information processing more generally. More information is better, period. Within that framework, the interest of businesses in the information privacy market in getting and using more complete information is presumptively rational and entitled to our extreme deference, and the burden is very much on those who would want any condition of information privacy to be produced in information privacy markets to explain why that ought to be the case. But failure to challenge this, uh, this information processing imperative then leaves privacy law and theory in an epistemological double bind. Big word, what do I mean? Um, when we accede to unrestricted flows of personal information, privacy people betray their own deepest commitments. But when they propose to restrict flows of information, privacy people expose themselves to charges of leadism and censorship. Failure to confront those issues then amounts to an effective concession that privacy really is at odds, not only with markets, but also and more fundamentally with inno innovation and truth. And that's why we're not talking about that. We're talking about something else like autonomy uh, instead. Uh, but as if that weren't bad enough, the incommensurable good that we point to, the autonomy that we point to typically when we're trying to avoid discussing the value of information processing doesn't help us either. Why is that? Uh, good liberals that we are, um, we sus subscribe to the idea that individuals um, have the capacity for pure uninfluenced decisions about what to disclose if only we could make sure that their choices are adequately informed, but that's just wrong. And by that I mean simply that we are never uninfluenced. Never, ever, ever, ever from the day we are born. Our beliefs and choices are produced by our social environment to an enormous extent. Autonomy, in other words, is a fiction and a dangerous one because it distracts us from much more fundamental questions about what different privacy conditions really do and which kinds of privacy conditions really do promote long-term individual and social welfare. We need to do better and we ought to be able to do better. How? Um, well, we could begin by recognizing that the frame imposed by our cultural DNA, by our deep-seated liberal commitments, is just that, a frame. Um, and within that frame, yes, the truth value of more and more information is assumed and elevated to a level beyond ideology, but the frame itself is an ideology. It's the frame that makes privacy seem irrational. And accepting the conclusions dictated by the frame then enables the other work that information processing does within our society to go unaddressed and unacknowledged, and in particular enables the social costs of information processing to go unaddressed and unacknowledged. Now there are small areas of social policy where we do recognize this, and in particular that children's privacy laws, um, which identify a class of subjects who don't have full autonomy interests, and the anti-discrimination laws, which, which purport to identify sometimes limited areas in which the social interests just become overpowering for other reasons. But we like to think of those areas as anomalies, um, instances of justified paternalism, if you like. We resist acknowledging too much more broadly based social justifications for privacy protection. Um, what are they? One is economic justice. Um, and this is Lior's talk about perfect exclusion, right? Information privacy markets have as their purpose and effect both the privileging of certain extremely wealthy and therefore desirable customer groups and the differential extraction of consumer surplus from everyone else. Weirdly slouching toward, um, toward a, a, a variant of Marxism from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs and we ought to be kicking and screaming about that because we purport not to like it. Um, this is unfair. I would say, but whether or not you agree with that, it ought to be possible to see that it creates huge long-term social costs as well. The second large social welfare objection is what I call the capabilities objection, um, which is simply this. All human beings require some breathing room for the development of critical subjectivity. And this is not because we are autonomous, we aren't, but it's because the only way we can ever hope to approximate our ideals of autonomy and the only way we as a society can approach our corresponding ideal of informed citizenship 
Information processing always does ideological work, period. When it denies the validity of those objections, it is doing ideological work. Information processing is informed by pre-existing logical and normative constructions, by categories, um, that dictate uh, that information processing proceed the way it does. This process may be so deeply buried between layers of social and market convention that we have difficulty seeing it, but it is there. I'm not trying to say that we never need any information. The development of individual profiles may, in some circumstances, be necessary to make markets work and to demonstrate respect for persons. But it also produces persons constructing the subjects of the emerging information society according to predetermined categories and risk tolerances. I think a more skeptical stance toward the information processing imperative is essential, um, precisely because it would enable privacy people of all stripes, egghead academics, lawyers, policy makers, to interrogate these processes more effectively. And that's essential if a truly informed debate about information privacy and so-called information privacy markets is to proceed. Um, and finally, I want to submit to you that we shouldn't assume in that debate, we shouldn't enter that debate assuming the optimal grain size for information units and information privacy markets and in profiles is the smallest possible size. Um, there are social benefits to more information up to a point, it is true, um, but it doesn't follow from that and it needn't follow from that that the social benefits keep increasing as the grain size gets smaller and smaller. The social costs of perfect exclusion that Lior talked about suggest instead that what we ought to prize is what I call in, in my book a condition of semantic discontinuity, um, some knowledge and some gaps in the knowledge because that's where you get all of the serendipity that is fruitful and all the room for individual growth that we need and that we've always claimed to prize. Um, so we shouldn't be talking out of both sides of our mouths about that if we, uh, if we uh, prize uh, that condition for individuals. We should have the discussion that will enable us to learn how to make our so-called information privacy markets into real ones. Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Paul, for doing this and for organizing uh, really an incredible lineup of people. It's a total privilege and honor to even get to sit at the table today um, because I uh, have learned an enormous amount from the people, the other people sitting here, and I don't think they've learned almost anything from me. So that's um, always a good conference, in my view, uh, at least for me. Um, in any case, uh, I'm going to do something a little dangerous in the spirit of what Paul started with, which was saying that. Um, Silicon, we try to get people talking to each other, and rather than go through my canned remarks um, completely, I'm going to try to actually begin that um, by responding a little bit or just playing a little bit with some of the comments already made, and then if I have time and that means, and still get in under less than, a, with more than an extra minute to go, um, I'll say some of the things that the slides up there are prepped to say. Um, mostly I want to start by saying I think that, that what's really fascinating reading these different papers that people ha are presenting here um, is the way in which every time I talk to groups of information or privacy people, whatever you want to call them, um, they're, we're really all trying to struggle with kind of the same set of problems, which is, to put it bluntly, what do we make of all this that's happening in, in the world around us? I think Julie has it exactly right that our language about that um, particularly talking about information privacy markets, gets very confused with just talking about information markets. Um, and our language isn't always all that helpful. But at the bottom, uh, we're, we're struggling with, with all of this information now available and the ways in which we're getting sorted and categorized and put into boxes and the lines that are getting drawn about each of us um, all the time, uh, that somehow doesn't feel right and people are trying to figure out what is it about all of that um, that's bothersome. Um, I, as an initial uh, risky move, I'm going to say to Lior, uh, the, as a, almost as a footnote, I'm not sure that we're going back to the 1801 um, phase with the bureaucrat who knows a lot about us. We're going to, a, to something that's sort of like that but it's really, we don't know, the, the new bureaucrat or decision maker, whoever he or she is, doesn't really know 
much about us, but they're acting as if they know a lot about us, right? So they, they now know tons of information like we have felt pads. You know, I was thinking of my wife who's a felt pad obsession person. Um, we know lots of things like that, but it's not the same kind of knowledge that that bureaucrat had about um, Mr. Johnson or any of the other people, you know, the, the, the people in your hypothetical in 1801. And more than that, it's a, a world we're now living in where we don't really know what the bureaucrat knows and we don't really understand how they know it, right? So that person in 1801 who got or didn't get welfare benefits because the bureaucrat thought or didn't think they were a re worthy recipient, they understood implicitly at least why the bureaucrat was discriminating against them, right? Why they were choosing not to give you the welfare benefits. Today, I think I could go to pretty much all the people in this room and say, can you really explain to me how you're being tracked, what information they have, how they're running the big data um, correlations and figuring out that you have felt pads on the bottom of your furniture, and do you have any clue how any of that's working? And even the smartest guys in the room, and the smartest people in the room, which are all pretty much here today, are gonna say, no, not really, right? We really don't know, which is somehow disconcerting, right? It's a kind of, we don't know how these decisions are happening, and that's um, one of the problems. Um, I'll also say to, in, in response to some of what Julie said, I think, um, by the way, you didn't pitch your book hard enough, but I've been reading some of the chapters of it, and um, th these two books are going to preoccupy the rest of our year for a lot of us, I think. Um, the book is wonderful, and I think you're exactly right that the way that we talk about uh, some of these issues, particularly when we use economic terms, is limiting. and. Um, I'm certainly guilty of that. At some level, you start to talk economics of privacy and you can get accused really quickly of kind of tinkering at the margins with the problem and not going down to the root level, as Julie was saying. Um, that said, uh, I think that the two things that you identified, economic injustice and the capabilities objection, combined with Lior's comment about exhaustion, which I love, um, he went by it fast, but if you get a chance to read the paper when it comes out, um, Lior has this third kind of basic problem with this new world of categorization we're living in, which is it's just very tiring, right? The idea that you're going to be signaling to every, everyone else 24-7 the type of person you are and making sure you're carrying the right books around so that you look the right kind of way or buying the right felt pads all the time is exhausting. And I would add to that, the sorting world we live in is exhausting too, right? How many of you have checked your credit scores from all three credit you know, score places this year so far? Just a show of hands. Yeah, okay, so the vast majority of you haven't, and the, the, this is a privacy conference, so the ones who have, I'm not totally surprised, but it's exhausting just to manage that part of the new economy that we're in. Um, the idea that we're gonna manage both all this information that's being used to sort us and all this information we can signal our type with really does seem sort of overwhelmingly tiring, um, which is why I think you see people not only editing their Facebook pages now to, to, to deal with timeline, but also just deleting their Facebook accounts, right? At some point it's just getting too tiring and I'm going to get out um, and try to, to pull back a little bit. Um, that said, I just wanted to, to lob a kind of fourth a uh, problem with this categorizing world and this sorting world that we're in, um, in addition to the, the economic injustice and the capabilities objection, and in addition to Lior's um, uh, exhaustion addition to that list, I think just the opacity and the complexity of it are in uh, themselves somewhat problematic. And I sort of tongue-in-cheek um, uh, in, my, in my draft that I shared with the panel um, was just playing with if you make a comparison between privacy um, and financial markets, for example. In the privacy world, you know, this is the FTC, one of the FTC pages. We tend to focus on individual decisions. Um, you know, these are a list of things that as an individual would be good for you to go do to protect your privacy, uh, put passwords in the right places and check your credit scores and all of these kinds of individual things. And in the literature, whether it's in legal literature or it's in economic literature, we tend to work on that left side in sort of the individual column of analysis of particular firms and the bad things they do, or um, analysis of individual decision makers and whether they're rational 
et cetera. And I was just asking the question, is there anything systemic we can, um, we can think about? Now, this is not a totally original question. Of course, people have been worrying about the system we're constructing or the architecture we're constructing a bunch. But I'll just give you three sort of things that I think um, add to this list of anxieties that you've already heard from others today. You know, one is that these entities are just getting really big. Um, and again, if you think about the financial uh, crisis of the last couple of years, one of the things we've learned is when things get really big and we don't really know much of what they're up to, um, that can be somewhat scary and ex post somewhat uh, danger. We discover it was somewhat dangerous. Um, you know, I'm not going to say a lot more about that other than um, somebody, if you look, if you put in Facebook too big to fail on Google, what you'll find is lots of people predicting, no, it's totally possible for Facebook to fail. People are going to eventually hate it enough that they're all going to leave and go use something else. And that's not what I mean. What I mean is, you know, you do start to imagine with entities this big, if one of them were to fail, would we have to take some kind of unusual intervention steps to make that failure palatable to the rest of the economy or the rest of society to manage those social costs. Because I'm not sure that you'd let Facebook's database go through bankruptcy, right? I mean, it just, or get sold off in a fire sale at the last minute. It just feels like maybe that's a social cost we wouldn't want to bear. I similarly think that the complexity and opacity are just terrifying in themselves. This is a wonderful infographic that Facebook put out. Everything you ever wanted to recently, everything you ever want to know about Facebook security, and there it is. Um, I spent some time with it and have no idea what it tries to tell you. Um, so I think this is sort of, a, you know, an example of we just don't know, um, not to pick on any of the firms listed there, uh, but you know, we've had issues already just in this ecosystem, just in the Facebook ecosystem with, whoa, what happens when you really try to understand the interconnectedness of all the app developers and all the players that are feeding information into that ecosystem? And just to, um, you know, that's one example, but let's look at the bigger example just of tracking in general, right? And kudos to the Wall Street Journal um, and its incredible series for bringing some of this to the public's attention in a way that's salient. But the truth is we don't have a clue, right? We don't have a clue what we've built. We don't have a clue where all these, I mean, you know, the Wall Street Journal did this wonderful thing where they took a fresh computer and took it to the top 100 websites and they discovered that 3,000 X number of cookies were installed just from one visit to each of those top 100 websites. That takes a lot of work to figure that out. If I asked any of you to actually reverse engineer who's, who's got all this information about you, you could not do it, right? It would be impossible. Um, that's a kind of complexity and opacity that could be hiding risk um, and that I think in itself has a social cost, to use Julie's term, which is that there's something disconcerting about living in a world where all of this discrimination, and I use it with a small d, but all of this sorting and categorizing is going on, has real economic consequence for you. The cost of your car insurance is moving up or down because of what's known about you and what you're telling people about yourself, and yet you really have no way of knowing any of that, how it's really functioning. Um, so, uh, I think, do I still have, do I, do I have a minute? Okay, I better stop quickly. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, I do think, and I say this uh, uh, just to be provocative and have some fun, um, I do think that in the financial world what you've seen is great public anger um, that's grown out of the, the reality that the public does not understand how the financial system um, is built and as a result, uh, as it came under strain and um, uh, failed in some ways, uh, the public is very angry about that. You built something you didn't understand and that lack of understanding created risk for the rest of us. Um, I wonder whether you end up with Occupy Palo Alto at some point, right? <laughs> Occupy the data center. I mean, there is a way, and I'm not advocating for that. I think there are privacy, there are privacy folks, maybe some in the room, who would love that, and I'm, I don't want to be I don't want to say that, but I, I do think there's a sort of funny analogy where the reality is our economy is now structured around these, this, these data and none of us understand how. And if something really terrifically bad happens, you may end up with the same kind of anger um, that you've seen in the financial crisis. Yeah.
Okay, let's get our bearings before we get into Q&A. We started about 10 minutes late, so I'm going to take those 10 minutes back, and we've got about 35 minutes for questions, that means. Um, I'm going to start by kind of trying to provoke a little bit of back and forth between uh, the panel members. Uh, I think the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to let Alessandro go first, because he hasn't spe spoken in a while. I want the other four to actually think about direct response specifically to Alessandro. I mean, I really do. He said a, a number of provocative things that I think we want to we want to make sure that we don't let go without comment. Um, I do want to start, though, with a tiny anecdote where I'm going to invade someone's privacy, uh, which is, you know, about a month ago, I called uh, my friend Baron Zoga, who runs a great think tank, Tech Freedom. He's right there in the back. And he's graciously actually agreed to join a panel to, um, to replace someone who had to drop out because of illness. Uh, and Baron said, I'm looking at some of the people on your first panel, and I'm not sure that there's anyone there who really believes uh, in kind of you know, full free market principles. And I said, no, Baron, there are plenty of people on the panel. You just don't know these people. Um, I was wrong. Um, <laughs> um, there, there, this was, this was, I think, a little more thoroughly critical. But, but when, we, when we tease out, I think, the differences in what was said, there actually was, uh, I think, a fair bit of healthy disagreement about the kind of level of commitment in the, the places where people are coming from. Um, and it's that I want to play out. And mostly, I just want to say, Baron, if your board gives you a hard time for co-sponsoring this, you have my apologies and, and my public statement about this. Um, no, but I, this is all, of course, in jest. So Alessandro, I would love for you to, like, if you can, just identify a couple of the themes you've heard and maybe build on what you've already set up for us um, in terms of kind of this argument you were making for Margaret Bill. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, this was quite amazing for me to hear all, all, all your points. And by the way, I, I, this is also considering the backgrounds we all have from law, law and economics, uh, HCI, uh, technology. Uh, to me, this is exactly what n needs to happen in the economics of privacy, taking not just a, um, a narrow economic approach, but augmenting it with uh, understanding of law, technology, and behavior. That said, I, I will start from a point uh, um, Julie made um, about the, um, the fact that we are not free for, from influence. I actually completely agree. There is no such thing as a default setting. Um, we are constantly influenced by our environment. And online, our environment is precisely designed to influence us. So we have to acknowledge that. Um, it also means that privacy to me is less about control of personal information, more about trying to um, limit the control that others can have on you when they have personal information uh, about you. Um, a second point Julie made, which also I, I found resonates with my own thinking, and I was trying to refer to that when I talk about the extremization of economics of privacy, is that even just talking about economics of privacy is a way already to limit frame the debate, uh, because economists can focus on uh, generally on quantifiable, tangible uh, trade-offs, costs and benefits, uh, at the detriment of many other dimensions of privacy which are uh, no less important. In fact, there was uh, one uh, uh, sentence which um, particularly uh, struck me in all the powerful arguments uh, Leo was making. The sentence when Leo was uh, quoting um, this Indian uh, uh, farmer, I believe, who said that, that now that I have my number, that gives me an identity. And uh, economically, this is very powerful. You, you, you can see what, why that's the case. All the, all the same, if you see it from another angle, that sentence is absolutely terrifying. The idea that uh, we exist uh, when we have a number that our identity is defined by our number. And, and this is the kind of future that uh, worries me. Um, connecting this to what Scott was discussing, channeling Leo, this exhaustion uh, that we have in trying to manage our information sphere becomes almost an existential exhaustion, in the sense that if we are defined by our information, Every action we do not only becomes a signal, a market signal, but if you're aware of that, everything we do is done in terms of the market signal. Uh, this, again, to me, is uh, uh, problematic. Um, I do share uh, Laurie's concern that the kind of approaches that we see now um, proposed for uh, behavior targeting, which is uh, 
very much related to this uh, exhaustion, exhaustion sorry, um, uh, argument Scott and Leo uh, were making. These tools we are, we, we are discussing will not, be, will not be enough, as uh, privacy policies have not been, been enough. Thank you. Now, again, I, I know the temptation will be to respond to all of the amazing talks, but I do want to focus us on Alessandro's. And, you know, Leo, I'll start with you. And, and I think what I want to <coughs> kind of set up for you is um, it seems like, you know, we've been piling a lot of things in one of the two scales on the balance that we're trying to achieve here. Um, and the other scale is looking a little barren, so let me throw a few weights into it, right? Um, so innovation, as Julie rightly points out, is this very powerful rhetorical club that you get in these debates. And, and it's hard to quibble with it, right? I mean, it, there, there isn't much in our economy that works anymore. Um, but Silicon Valley tends to produce a lot of what does work really well. Um, and so, academia you know. Academia works really well. Academia works really, really well. <laughs> You're right. Good point. Um, and so, you know, uh, Julia, maybe Julie said the golden goose, but I, I you know, let's, let, it's not just a pejorative. I mean, this, this is really serious stuff we're talking about cutting back on. Um, Yet Alessandro, using the, the language of political economy and, frankly, of law, talks of shifting the burden to those who would dare to grow the economy, I'm, I'm caricaturing what you said, um, um, from those of us who want information privacy. And you didn't really respond to that, so I'd love to hear what you think about, like, should the burden shift? Should it be we always choose the regulatory path or the economic path or the market path that leads to privacy unless you can convince us that your funky new social networking site is worth bending those rules? Yeah, I, I think I want to say I, I don't think so. And, and this is where um, you know, I'll, I'll be the, the maybe most free market person on the, on the panel, uh, which is consistent with stuff I've written. So uh, I, I'll go ahead and, and play that role, but, I, but I'm, not, I'm not just acting. Um, people are heterogeneous, very heterogeneous with respect to their preferences for sharing information about themselves. And Julie's right that, that those preferences um, come from somewhere. Uh, but especially once we're talking about adults, uh, people are reasonably well informed. And I think the dangers associated with letting people <coughs> make mistakes and then, and then subsequently coming to regret those mistakes are very real, but probably pale in comparison to the dangers associated with the state imposing its own preferences on individuals, right? Which might work really well for people who value privacy significantly, but might work terribly for people who value the gains of disclosure, right? I, I agree with Alessandro. That quote from, the, from, the, from Muhammad Jalil is uh, in, in one level, uh, exciting and inspirational, right? Here's someone who's been trapped economically, trapped socially, and now all of a sudden an identity means he can move. It means he can, he can take on new challenges and new opportunities. He might fail, but he can take them on uh, and he might succeed. Uh, the, so, so that's, I think, the very, the very positive story we can tell. I, I think, you know, responding to Alessandro's work, I think it's one reasonable uh, response is, oh my gosh, we've got to change the defaults and change the burdens. But I think whether we're attracted by that solution depends on the baseline population that we're dealing with. If we've got a, a baseline population that really values these benefits of disclosure, then to shift the default in that way could be counterproductive. Whereas if we've got a baseline population that really uh, is likely to make mistakes um, that they subsequently come to regret, uh, or uh, can't be trusted, or isn't well educated, or is confronted with the issues that Scott talked about, where you know even the smartest, most well-informed person can't possibly understand the implications of buying a felt pad or buying this car versus that car, uh, or taking out that line of credit versus the other line of credit. Then I think um, you know. Then I think uh, there's strong arguments for shifting the defaults, and so part of what us as scholars need to do is really try and drill down as deeply as possible to do experimental work, to do survey research, and figure out where people will co are coming from and what the costs of making one group or the other unhappy are. And then, uh, Scott, you know, you're, you're welcome to respond to any of these things. I'm just going to work my way down the line. But um, I think one, one thing I'd tee up for you is you actually did talk a lot more about kind of um, the economic calculus of what Alessandro was proposing. Uh, Julie also teed up for us 
um, the rhetoric of knowledge. I mean, very often these debates turn not into you're going to break the economy, but it's you're going to prevent us from saving premature babies, right? I mean, what you're toying with here isn't just well-being, it's life itself. And that's a, that's a rhetorical move that's hard to oppose. I think I'm just asking you for counseling and advice because I face this rhetoric all the time. And you put out these four kind of other concerns. Don't they pale in comparison to the Framingham Heart Study to figuring out how to make us all live prosperous lives? I mean, what do we, what do we say in response to that? If, we want, if you want to say anything. I mean, maybe you just think that trumps. Oh, that's a hard question. Uh, <laughs> no, so, I mean, first of all, I'm not sure I accept the premise in the question, right, which is that do you really need all of this information to do that study? No, right? You need it specific. So you, 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 you say, well, I want to go study X. I want to study premature babies. Um, okay, that's fine, but I think Alessandro's somewhat provocative slide about shifting the burden of proof, the question he's asking is, really, do you, do you need to know absolutely everything about Julie Cohen to do a study of premature babies? No, right? Th those are two sort of separate things. And maybe... Um, but, in, but they'll say yes. They'll say, how, how are you to know? Right. The more I know, the better my science and knowledge will be. So R right. where, how are you so confident the answer to that is no? Yeah, I'm not confident. I okay. mean, I, 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 I'm not confident. That's why these trade-offs and these conversations are so hard. The, the other thing I, I just wanted to throw in, because I think it's important to some of the conversation, and it's sometimes lost when we talk about privacy, is that the information shift that's happening, where now you can sort people in all these different ways, as people have all been talking about today, people can now also sort other things in all kinds of new ways. There's, there's a kind of knowledge now that you have as a consumer that people seem to like increasingly. They know lots and lots about goods. They know lots and lots about professors. They know lots and lots about merchants and restaurants, and Yelp will tell you almost anything you want to know about almost anything. Suddenly, it's not just an, a, a shift where the bureaucrat is now armed with information about Lior, but where Lior is now armed with all sorts of information about the markets and the environment that he's living in. And part of the challenge, I think, for when you talk just about privacy is consumers are starting to realize how much that information they like. I mean, I'll use Paul Lum as an example. We were laughing one day where Paul was saying, gee, every time I buy anything or go to any restaurant, you know, I spend an hour and I look it up and I make sure whether it's going to be good. I never eat in bad restaurants anymore. Now, that felt exhausting to me, right? I just go to local, not that important, but but the reality is that's part of the knowledge change and part of the trade-offs change that people are experiencing. It's like, it's not just that they know more about me, but now I know a lot more about them. And I think that's sort of hard in the privacy conversation to figure out what, what that does also. So, so Laurie, I'm going to do the same thing I tried to do with Scott, which is say whatever you want, but I'll pose the question that you're free to respond <laughs> which to. Which I did, <laughs> pretty much. Um, no, no, you actually took, took me took exactly what I asked. Um, so as the, as the computer scientist on the panel, I'd love to hear your response to Alessandro's very brief discussion of Sisyphus, right? So, and, and Lior touched on this theme as well. In a sense, it's the new technology that comes tomorrow will disrupt everything we understand today. And I think that was a theme of what you were saying with P3PA. It was definitely what Lior was saying about felt pads and facial recognition. And so as a computer scientist, can you help us build something concrete predictively or a taxonomy to help us understand like where technology is going. Yeah, so all I'm asking you is predict the future of technology. <laughs> it's a small question, but I don't mean, uh, yeah, you got a minute or two, but not, spe <laughs> not specifically. I mean, can you help us like make sense of big things happen and then little things happen or it's we just can't predict and we're foolish to try or something in between? Well, gee, Paul, I left my crystal ball. Oh, today. man. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I think it is really hard to, to predict w you know, what's going to happen next, um, except that to, to say that it's going to be big and it's going to be something that we hadn't thought of. Um, although it, it's interesting, I, I have a 10-year-old son, and um, I think a lot of the things that seem amazing and surprising to us are not at all surprising to him. They're, they're, they're just exactly what he expects. And, um, you know, when, when I complain that he's not doing his Spanish homework, he looks at me and he says, 
it's stupid to study Spanish. You know, all I'm going to have to do is like speak English into my phone, and we'll spit it out in Spanish, right? You know, like he he's decided that that's going to happen. You know, by the time he needs to speak Spanish, and and he's probably right. Um, and and you know, there are labs where you can already do this. Um, so so I, I I think that the things are changing. You know, in big and, and amazing ways quickly. Um, but that said. Um, does that mean that we just throw up our hands and say we can't make policy because we don't know what the future um, entails? And, and I, I don't think that's the case. I, I, I think we have to be flexible in the policy that we make. But, but I, I think we can, you know, look at patterns. And you know, as much as as, as you know, technology has changed. Um, what I was saying, you know, I keep experiencing deja vu is that in the you know privacy tools space, I don't think anything's changed. I think you know the you know do not track is is the latest privacy technology. Do Not Track is actually a lower tech technology than P3P was 15 years ago. Right? So it's not changing. Um, and, and maybe the problem is, is that technology is changing, but privacy technology isn't. I, I don't know. But, but um, it, 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 it seems like we, we shouldn't just be scared of the fact that technology is changing so fast. I, I, I told my first grader's teacher, I didn't understand why they spent so much time reading clocks. Because the idea that you'd need to know how to read an analog clock to, for my kids' generation seems really unusual, uh, yet they insist. They spend weeks and weeks on clocks. Um, and then Julie, I'm actually excited to save you know, the last question in this round for you, um, which is the one thing about your paper, which I've told you I love, is I'm not sure how wholly critical you're willing to be with the argument you're making. And I mean kind of critical in the, in the more formal legal theory sense. Because although it seems like you're inching up to like a pure postmodern, damn you all, we're gonna we're gonna do this a different way sort of thing, toward the end you then throw negative externalities back into it, or maybe maybe I misread the way you were using that phrase. And it seems like you really actually do want to balance things, a new cost benefit, and, and and in some way there's a lot of economics to your critique of economics. And is that just because you want to convince people and you don't want to? Abandon the project altogether, or am I just misreading everything you're trying to say? Well, um, or both. So, so one thing I played with in the paper, but it may not survive, is is um, I saw your your you as teeing up the question. Um, you know, is behavioral economics the nirvana for for how to finally do economic analysis of this? And to which my answer is only if it can it can really do the economic analysis of this. So, that, so the discussion of mm -hmm. the negative externality is um, me playing with a way to try to make this expressible in a vocabulary that could then allow extension of the method. And I'm not really sure, since I don't do behavioral economics or <coughs> any other kind, whether that will, whether that will end up um, bearing fruit. That said, though, um, it, you know, so much of this actually does center around the valuation of the externality. And so I would actually, I would go back to um, the exchange you had with Leora about innovation mm -hmm. um, and quibble with it because so much of what precipitated the financial crisis that we're now experiencing is, you know, the, the um, <laughs> the financial whiz people who said, we're innovating, right? We're creating these innovative um, trading tools and, and um, at the regulatory level that I think, I think um, one, one thing that enabled, you know, even massive institutions that ought to be accountable like, like national central banks to evade regulatory oversight of their, of their capital, um, uh, uh, um, yeah, they, they, they was their position that it's so complicated and innovative that you, the regulators, can't understand, and therefore, um, within the framework of the Basel Accords, which I don't know very much more about than what I'm about to say, you have to leave us free to regulate ourselves, right? We'll tell you whether we've got enough capital, and we'll tell you, um, and, and, and at the hedge fund level, it's um, how much can I get away with in terms of innovating um, in, 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 uh, in the uh, domain of these, of these of these new um, uh, trading instruments um, that are just too fancy for you Dumbo regulators to even understand. Well, look what happened, right? Um, you can't just say you're going to break the economy, 
um, uh, and, and expect people to sit there with a straight face and go, oh, okay, you know, it, it's, just, it's just not true. What we are really, really bad at um, is, um, is valuing the part of the negative externality that includes systemic risk. Um, and we're bad at valuing the rest of the of the of what goes into the negative externality as well, the, the consequences um, for people's privacy. The um, uh, when when you decide, you know, am I gonna um, when when Google decided, okay, we're gonna buy YouTube, um, uh, and this is kind of shifting into my other area, which is copyright. Um, uh, presumably, uh, they didn't think, um, oh. Uh, Part of what makes YouTube valuable is people will still be continuing to post videos of their cats, um, uh, and, and that's why we want to buy it. They thought what makes it valuable is we have the subscriber base and the eyeballs and the platform to roll out this kind of um, content delivery system, and, and uh, in our ideal world, YouTube eventually will, will not just be videos of people's cats, it will be monetized content. Um, and there's something that gets lost. Um, uh, and it's precisely an ability to value the externalities. We can't really understand what makes uh, the, the human dimensions of what makes a, a platform or a set of transactions valuable or not valuable. Um, you can't just say you're going to break the economy. You can't just say, oh, but it's innovation, um, uh, and expect everybody to just nod and say, um, okay, you know, well, we, we won't regulate you then. Um, I think it's been proved to be wrong. That's great. And uh, Alessandra, I think I'm going to let the audience get some more questions for you. I will say, though, Julianne, your point, I think, I think you were just using the cautionary tale from the financial markets as a cautionary tale, as an analogy, but of course there's a direct link, which is what are all these PhD physicists who can no longer get Wall Street jobs doing today? They're doing big data, right? And for those of you who were playing in the lottery, it took two hours, seven minutes for me to mention big data, but, <laughs> but, but it's, it's the exact, it's not an analogy, it's the exact same quantitative analysis done by the exact same people Maybe this is what Scott's paper is, I think, pushing on. Maybe it's not going to lead to the same horrific results, but at least it, 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 I think, gives me a little bit of pause. All right, I'm invoking the wiser role. The first question must come from a student in the audience. Students here know I have a bad memory for names, so there are only two or three of you I uh, am likely to call on, so you might as well just put the others out of misery and call. Jana Fisher, how are you doing? I probably was going to call on you anyway, so that was very astute, yes. <laughs> So my question is mostly directed at Lior and the world you're describing where if I go buy McDonald's because I'm in a hurry or I want comfort food, my credit rating is going to drop because somebody decides I don't have money to go to the grocery. Are we already there? And if we're already there, is there, is there any turning back? No, so I, I don't think we're there yet, uh, but we're more there in some industries than others. So. Um, I think Paul may have mentioned the insurance industry. Uh, it, based on what I've been able to learn about the insurance industry, it actually really surprises me how badly they've incorporated um, information along the lines of what I'm describing. And I think the credit card industry is way, way ahead of them. I mean, a, a decade maybe. Uh, and there's not a good economics so market failure to the extent that we think all firms are likely to um, uh, are likely to uh, immediately embrace technological changes that uh, will maximize their bottom lines. I think that's actually uh, not a story that we can tell about these industries. I think industry culture matters. I think some industries have a lot more investment in research and development than others. Uh, but I think it's, inc it's becoming uh, increasingly true, let's say, in, uh, in credit and in, um, and as best I can tell, in uh, the sorts of ads you see uh, in online browsing, which frankly is, I think, much lower stakes than credit or insurance um, or uh, employment. Uh, I guess my sense is that uh, there are lots of firms out there that do uh, job screening and they'll uh, help uh, mine data for people who are applying for jobs and then give employers that data. I want to say that's somewhere in between the high level of sophistication that, let's say, Capital One is at and the relatively low state of sophistication that um, a farmer's insurance is at. Um, and, uh, and it'll be interesting to watch the different industries evolve and see whether a regulatory response from Washington differentially affects some industries more than others, right? When Washington regulates, it tends to be industry by industry rather than in a comprehensive way. And so 
uh, that could also uh, cement any uh, existing differences that we do see between these industries. So we're not there yet for most of our lives, but we seem to be going there uh, in different parts of our lives at varying speeds. Alessandro, you want to add to me? What to make a comment? And this is not a comment contra Leo. I, I feel we, we may perhaps agree on what I'm about to say, but I feel it's an important point nevertheless. I would like to dispel the myth that more information will lead to really perfect exclusion, uh, uh, perfect prediction. In reality, there will always be noise uh, and errors. We will never achieve 100% accuracy rate. And why is this important? Because the better the systems become, the more we will trust them. And we will use them to make decisions about people that 95% of the times will be correct, 5% of the times may be dramatically wrong. And the consequences, the more we trust the system, because uh, they are objective algorithms, in fact, they are socially constructed, the more we trust them, the more costly these mis mistakes become. That's why I, I remain a strong believer in privacy and asset technologies uh, as uh, forms of uh, ways to protect ourselves from this type of errors. If you limit the usage of data through privacy and technologies, then you can have uh, uh, more data used to save babies and perhaps less data used to make you spend one more hour on Farmville. <laughs> Anyone else want a quick response? Okay, so now we're gonna open it up to the broader audience. Um, I feel the right of reply is due to Baron, so go ahead and you can take the first question from the audience. <laughs> Why don't you wait for the mic so we can get you on the stream? <clears throat> well, let me first say I'm just I'm happy to be here, even if I am grossly outnumbered. I, I like a fight and being an underdog. Um, and, uh, and and when I say a fight, I, I mean a, a healthy discussion. Out outnumbered in this room, let's be clear. Right. You don't mean nationally speaking, perhaps. Right. See, <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Sorry. Well, uh, more generally in the privacy debate, I mean, there is a reason why the, the, there are so few of us here who, uh, who come at this from a more market-oriented perspective. But anyway, without getting into the broader debate, uh, well, I'm just curious about, um, in particular, Scott's uh, comments, and this, this leads into a broader question for everyone, which is to say why we think the existing, what I would call a, a sort of quasi-common law system is inadequate. So in particular, let me just take the example that Scott mentioned about um, uh, his concern that firms might be too big to fail and what would happen if firms went into bankruptcy? What would happen to these vast databases? Well, we already have case law on that. The uh, FTC in particular last year uh, intervened in the bankruptcy of XY Magazine, which was a magazine for gay teens that for many years promised its subscribers that they wouldn't share um, their data beyond the magazine itself, which is you know, obviously quite reasonable. And the FTC intervened in the bankruptcy to say that uh, they wanted to make sure the bankruptcy court held the company to that, um, to that promise. And that essentially meant that the asset that was left at the end of the day, which was the subscriber list, which was the data that the company had, um, basically was, gonna be, was just going to disintegrate. And that that was okay. That, that was, that was the, the privacy intervention that the FTC made there. And that's something that I applauded them for. Um, and, and it seems to me something we could probably all agree on here, but, but the point of the question is simply to say, why do you think that the current system is inadequate? I mean, we have the FTC intervening in cases like that. Uh, the FTC hasn't intervened in some other cases, like, for example, uh, this case that the, um, was brought against Amazon for falsifying their P3P cookie. Uh, it was thrown out by the court, not because there wasn't deception, but because there was no um, uh, harm proven no, uh, under the particular statute that, that was, um, was being uh, uh, invoked by the court. Whereas the FTC, uh, it seems to me, could bring an enforcement action against companies that lie in their, uh, in their, in their disclosures, generally speaking, just as they could bring a, uh, an action for a company that lied in anything that it said in a human-readable statement. Uh, so why is that system inadequate? And in particular, why can't we look to the um, guidelines on unfair and deceptive trade practices that the FTC issued in the early 1980s to clarify its meaning of those terms and, and trust that there is going to be a common law developed out of this that inherently in, uh, under those, those policy guidelines um, both accounts for, uh, in the case of unfairness, a balance between benefits and costs. And in the case of deception, allows the FTC to go out and punish deceptive trade practices even without that clear showing of harm that has frustrated the sorts of privacy uh, actions that, that you probably would all like to see. So 
why, why is that inadequate? Why do we need a more legislative or prophylactic response based on uh, the precautionary principle? Okay, so I mean, I think it's, and it's useful to focus on this one very specific scenario, right? The, the bankrupts. What do we do with a company with their data in bankruptcy? So, Scott, if you want to, you teed the topic up. If you take uh, sure. A um, I, first of all, I'm not sure I disagree with you, right? So, I'm, I actually, um, I think I'll make the same caveat that, that Lior made, which is uh, uh, in most of my interest or most of the writing that I've done so far on this, I think I'm accused of being more pro-market and pro-economics than the opposite, although I think I sounded the opposite today. Um, so I'm not sure that I know uh, that, that there is something in that specific example of a bankruptcy with lots of, of data um, that, the, that the existing regulatory apparatus isn't going to handle. Um, I think the, the reason I was invoking the example was a little different than that, right, which is trying to talk about um, I was really trying to talk about what I think is Lior's, the, 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 the interesting nugget in Lior's question, which is what's the difference between where we're headed, maybe not quite there yet in all industries, but where we seem to be headed, and the 1801 example that you started us with? Because it's the difference between those two things that I think is really interesting in creating anxiety. And this scale and type of knowledge um, problem is one of those differences, right? We know that whoever, pick your, pick your firm, um, is holding massive amounts of data about us, and we know lots of those firms exist, and we really don't know almost anything about, about that structure. Um, that is a pretty fundamental difference in our experience of why these decisions are getting made about us than the drunk was in 1801 with his individual bureaucrat. And I think people are beginning to push back on that a little bit, right, and trying to say there's something systemic, there's something structural that's anxiety provoking when it's so opaque. Um, can the FTC handle all this? Maybe, uh, I don't know. Um, we're gonna have some FTC folks later who may say they can. Um, but regardless of the regulatory response exactly, uh, the scale and opacity, I think, are part of um, um, why this new world or this new type of sorting seems wrong or seems terrifying to people. Um, so I don't know if this, is, this analogy is going to work, but it, it entertains me. Okay, so suppose we have, um, suppose we have a chemical and we know it's dangerous, right? And, and, and call it PCB. And, um, and, and so we, we spend a lot of time perfecting a regulatory regime uh, under which it can be contained. And, and if a firm that has a bunch of it goes bankrupt, then we have a proceeding by which that can be kept contained and handed off to some other firm um, in orderly bankruptcy workout. Um, and, but, but it can be, the chemical can be broken down and it can be released um, into the environment in, in another form called PCG, um, and it isn't harmful, so we don't restrict that uh, a, a, at all. Um, and we just allow people to do it. Um, and then suppose it turns out that it's really easy for people out there to just take PCG and make PCB. Um, a PC, a, 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 and, and suppose it turns out that um, in fact, the, the, um, the reservoirs that we built for containing PCB um, are in fact vulnerable and insecure and don't work and there's some significant risk of them leaking. Um, then if you ask yourself, okay, what are the risks of a large PCB disaster, the bankruptcy workout proceeding is, is not what you would point to. You would point to the risk of leaks and you would point to the risk that people would take this inert chemical um, and make the harmful one. And that's what we have, right? The, the, um, Paul has written about how easy it is to re-identify supposedly de-identified information. Um, so, um, so in fact, uh, uh, the, it's, it's the supposedly inert stuff that we need to be worrying about far more than we do. Um, and lots of other people um, 
uh, Danielle Citron, who, who isn't here, um, Chris Hufnagel, who is here, have written about how um, insecure the data reservoirs are um, and how they're extraordinarily vulnerable to identity theft and other kinds of leaks. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and so then to say, well, why doesn't the, the bankruptcy work out work um, just seems not to be focusing on the entirety of the problem. And in fact, the privacy example is even worse than the stupid chemistry example that I, that I just gave you because um, what we, we make representations to people, oh, look, we've got this orderly proceeding. We have the FTC, we have privacy policies, we have disclosure, which encourages them um, to give more. And, and when we reduce the information, it'll only be the inert form, right, the, the, the de-identified form. It encourages them to give up more and more information relying on the orderliness of the procedure that we think is good, um, uh, which magnifies the other two problems that I described. Um, so, so no, it isn't good enough um, uh, to, to focus just on one little part of the problem. So although I gave Baron Red a reply, I'm going to let Julie end this part. We're going to have one more time for one more question. Um, I will say as a plug to a kind of a, a, a sister organization on Monday, for those of you in D.C., the Future of Privacy Forum has arranged a really interesting day of speakers on de-identification, re-identification. I wish I could be there, but unfortunately I can't. Um, but I commend that to you if you're in D.C. So, yeah, final question. Go ahead. Thank you. I had um, one observation and then a question to follow. So one of the things that I observed um, throughout the panel was the use of certain language and the use of what if, suppose, and assume. Um, those words are very heavily used, and so I just throw that out there as food for thought. And my question is, um, there's been some discussion of self-regulatory model, um, regulatory model. I'd just like each of you to elaborate a little bit on that in, with regard to the perils um, or perhaps benefits of both, and then also um, touch on the co-regulatory I don't know that we, we really touched on that, and, and you said someone might speak to that, so. Yeah, I mean, I'll say two things. One, I, w I would love to give everyone the opportunity, but I mean, that could be 45 more minutes, so, so come up with your pithiest two sentences on that, and know that for the rest of the day, I think that will be probably the prevailing theme. So whoever wants to speak on that, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I think the, the self-regulatory model, um, you know, is in support of this whole free market concept, but for it to be successful, it relies on enforcement, um, and it relies on all of the, the companies to get on board and to do it, and I think what we've seen is that we have definitely some leaders out there who are embracing the self-regulatory model and doing a great job, but they're, they don't have the entire industry with them. And so um, they're, in the self-regulatory model, uh, there may be nothing that, um, that any regulator or anybody with enforcement authority can do about the companies that just say, well, I'm not going to play. Anyone else want to comment? How do we regulate this? How do we, or should we regulate this? Right? What's the right balance? Uh, perhaps it, it was clear for, from, my, from my talk that um, I do not believe self-regulatory approaches are going to work. They rely on uh, notice and consent and anything I know from experiments I and many others have done is that notice and consent are not enough. The kind of regulation I would like to see is a regulation which fosters the deployment of privacy enhancing technologies. I am a big believer in technology. I don't, I'm not so naive to believe to think that uh, privacy and safety technologies will solve all the problems or will be costless, but I do believe that with help uh, of policy makers uh, creating the right infrastructure to deploy them, we could achieve a better economic equilibrium. Anyone else, Scott? Yeah, I'll just say one short thing, which is, you know, I set out into this uh, arena in part because I was convinced that in most markets when something's going wrong, and I loved the slide about what constitutes a market failure, but what, when something's going wrong, intermediaries almost are one of the ways markets cure um, problems, right? Intermediaries arise to um, fix or address market failures. And I was just convinced I was going to be able to find what I was calling privacy intermediaries, right? Intermediaries who were following pretty good strict rules they were imposing on themselves. Um, and there are some examples of that. Chris. Uh, Nagel's been trying to convince me to finish this paper, and I'm trying, except that, you know, you look at some examples of firms that are holding themselves out as privacy protecting, um, and I won't name any of them because it wouldn't seem nice, even though I would be trying to be nice to them. Um, 
you look at their privacy policies, they're no better than any, any other intermediary or firm that's collecting data about us. You try to figure out what sort of commitments they're making that would really reassure a user that this is somehow a privacy enhancing intermediary as opposed to lots of other kinds of, for example, behavioral marketing uh, intermediaries, and I can't find them. And that's odd, right? It, it speaks a lot to Alessandro's basic work, which is there's no demand for them. Um, if, inter if individuals aren't, um, aren't asking for them to be created, they're not gonna have enough demand to pay for them for their services. But where are, where are they? Why have the privacy enhancing moves not gone anywhere? Um, and I think that, that uh, at the end of the day, the real answer is because you can do the non-privacy version so easily and make so much more money so more, so, with, so much, so with so little oversight that it's pretty hard to compete with that uh, as a privacy protective, um, or more privacy protective, let's just say it that way, um, entity. So I'll stop, but. Leo, are you got something quick here? Uh, just to be very pithy, I think the case for self-regulation is strongest when we're dealing with data that's been recently collected for consumers, and it's weakest when we're dealing with data that was collected long ago. I think Alessandro's Sisyphus problem is enormous, and nobody's been able to successfully educate consumers about just how divergent their responses to whether they're willing to disclose information about them given a certain set of consequences are from uh, the consequences that may follow 10 years down the line. So uh, to me, the, the uh, things like data retention are uh, something that either uh, there needs to be massive efforts to educate consumers about the importance of data retention policies, or that's the area where there's the strongest argument for government intervention. Any other last comments? Please join me in thanking the panel.